lecture, the first lecture of 2024, uh, and a lecture that is uh, related and connected uh, with our exhibition in the name of humanity, uh, American Relief Aid in Greece, 1918 to 1929. And uh, it is my pleasure to tell you that uh, the exhibition will be open after the end of the lecture. Uh, so uh, you can, uh, those of you who have not had the chance to see it, and I know Yorgos is one of these people, uh, it would be great uh, if you can take a peek uh, and uh, maybe talk more uh, there about uh, several issues. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's a great, great pleasure to welcome to Athens and to the Yenadios uh, Library uh, Yorgo Topalidis, uh, who is uh, a young scholar uh, who has uh, been inspirational for us uh, regarding uh, the exhibition. Uh, he's a visiting lecturer at the Department of uh, Behavioral Sciences at Flagler College uh, in Florida. And uh, he also teaches as an adjunct professor at the State College of Florida and the University of Florida. Uh, Dr. Topalidis uh, received his doctorate uh, in sociology from the University of Florida uh, in 2022 uh, with a dissertation that is very much related to the talk that he's going to present to us tonight, uh, uh, trying to understand the whitening process model uh, through the study of European immigrants in the United States, focusing on um, immigrants from uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Dr. Topalidis uh, holds uh, also the Modern Greek Studies Association Johnny Atridis uh, Prize for Best Dissertation in English, and this is a great, uh, a great award and a great honor, and uh, it's, it's wonderful, and, and congratulations for that, Yorgo. Uh, and his research interests uh, are uh, focus on race and ethnicity, emigration from the Ottoman Empire to the U.S., uh, white identity construction, contestation, and transgenerational memory transfer. I'm not a sociologist, so some of these words are a little bit hard for me to pronounce, but I hope uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm not doing a disservice uh, by sort of trying to, to pronounce them. Uh, he ho holds an MA in history from Southern Connecticut State University, uh, where his thesis focused on the Greek American community in New York uh, City uh, in the first 20 years uh, of uh, the 20th century. And, uh, but uh, he started as, as a scientist and he has a, a degree in biology and a master's in microbiology. But I think this is long gone as a career, <laughs> and he has now seen the light, uh, and uh, he's uh, preparing a book uh, on uh, the social construction of Ottoman Greek migrant identity in the early 20th century. Um, and uh, what uh, he will be talking to us tonight uh, is very much uh, at the crux uh, of this uh, argument, uh, trying to figure out uh, the ideas of whiteness and, and what it means to be uh, white uh, and all these kinds of contract, constructs. Uh, and he has already published his findings in several, several journals uh, and several uh, new studies are coming out in collected volumes. Um, one of the most, uh, I think, significant and important parts of his part of his work, and uh, the part that actually made us know him and find him, uh, came through the digital humanities projects that he has been involved with, and we are extremely grateful uh, for your openness uh, in uh, sort of making these uh, projects happen and also sharing the information. He has been intimately connected uh, as a researcher and project coordinator with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. Uh, and uh, he has uh, uh, been able to archive and present uh, a lot of material and I think we will hear a little bit more about it tonight. So uh, this evening he's going to talk to us uh, about uh, his uh, research as it connects uh, with uh, the exhibit. Uh, and the title of the talk is Ottoman No More, I Mikrasiate Iper Ton Dinopathundon Adelfonton. So, Yorgo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Maria, for, for that wonderful uh, introduction. I'd also like to thank 
uh, the Gennadios Library um, and the American School of uh, Classical Studies at, at Athens uh, for providing me with the opportunity to present to you my research uh, uh, this evening. Um, what you're going to see tonight uh, are elements from the exhibition that I'm sort of working into a journal article. And uh, the title of my talk is Symbolic, as you'll see. Um, and it's symbolic because <laughs> Let's see if it, okay. Um, uh, it's, it's symbolic because the main research question I'm asking here for this journal article, and as you'll see for this presentation, uh, is how did Micraciate uh, act in other words, how did the Asia Minorites uh, act in, in favor of their struggling uh, brethren? Um, now, taken at face value, this would seem like a, uh, an easy question to try to answer at least, but um, there's a lot to this question. And when I say that, I don't only mean uh, trying to figure out the answer by looking at available uh, information and data. Uh, that I've collected, but also other researchers have collected. Um, it's complicated because of the words that are being used in the question itself, right? Uh, and that's one of the things that I'm going to try to get at today, tonight with you, uh, is what do these words mean, right? What does it mean to say uh, what, what do we mean when we say um, and ultimately try to get to the question at hand uh, also. So, uh, we'll spend some time uh, looking at uh, the ways in which Ottoman Greek identity was constructed and deconstructed uh, in the early 20th century in a U.S. context. Uh, and then we'll also spend some time looking at the uh, organizations that these migrants uh, established in the United States uh, and what was the importance of these organizations in their daily lives and sort of uh, their connections to their vinopathis adelfi, their brethren, uh, who, their struggling brethren. So um, to begin, we have to sort of provide some conceptual frameworks for our, the presentation, for the study at hand also. Um, Maria rightfully um, you know, uh, brought up the, the fact that I, a lot of my research looks at the social construction of identity, immigrant identity specifically, and Ottoman Greek immigrant identity to be more specific. Uh, so social constructionisms, so the idea that, you know, there's social forces at play uh, that play a major role uh, in the ways in which we understand identity, both for ourselves and the way that we um, present it to other people, and sort of the negotiation process that we go through on a daily basis to not only present our <clears throat> national or ethnic identity, but other types of identity as well. And sometimes this leads us into situations where we have to sort of defend who we, we think we are, uh, or perhaps we, we find ways to connect with other people and form larger groups. This is what social construction of identity is all about. And, I, and you know, all of these different researchers that are sort of listed here look at, look at these dynamics in, in one way uh, or another. Um, in addition, um, migration networks theory uh, will play a role in my talk tonight because it would, you know, it would basically not be possible to create these organizations uh, were it not for the kith and kin, the family members, friends uh, of the migrants that uh, traveled to the United States, established themselves, and then provided the groundwork for others to join them uh, where they lived, right? to, to find for them uh, work, uh, places to live, uh, and ways to sustain themselves. And this is what migration networks theory is all about. It talks about uh, sort of this process by which um, the country of destination and the country of origin are connected through these social networks of individuals uh, living in both countries uh, and providing the means for these uh, uh, new migrants to come and settle uh, or at least have a, a, you know, a fighting chance at, at settling successfully. Um, next. Uh, related to migration networks theory is this idea of remittances, this concept of remittances. Um, and uh, current scholarship looks at this uh, concept and sort of describes the ways in which migrants uh, will, in one way or another, um, uh, send monetary support back to their places of origin. 
uh, whether it be as individuals to their family members and friends, uh, or as groups and organizations uh, to, to organizations in their uh, places of origin, uh, or to individuals that need that aid uh, in their places of origin. Last but not least here we have um, quite a bit of work that has been done in organizational studies uh, to look at mutual aid societies and there's all sorts of uh, scholarship available about mutual aid organizations. Uh, another way to, to sort of uh, characterize them would be uh, ethnic organizations uh, in the scholarship and you know uh, a quite a variety of scholarship exists that looks at Irish, Jewish, Italian, um, organizations, mutual aid societies, uh, and sort of their activities, so uh, the, their community building activities, their philanthropic activities, uh, the ways in which they help support their, the uh, incoming migrant communities. Um, and in addition to those, uh, there's quite a bit of scholarship about Greek and Greek American organizations as well uh, in a U.S. context. So HEPA, uh, GAPA, the Pan-Hellenic uh, Union uh, are, are some amongst many. And then, though, although those are well known or better known, uh, one of the first, Silogos Briseo and Anavritis from Sparti, uh, is not as well known, uh, at least it hasn't been written about um, and studied as extensively as the others. Uh, and yet it sort of falls within this fold of uh, organizational studies and the ways in which mutual aid societies play a role in community building and supporting uh, um, populations not only in the United States, but also uh, in Greece. And then last but not least, uh, the uh, sort of the central uh, focus of our talk tonight uh, is also going to be Ottoman Greek mutual aid societies. Well, this is really one of the, the main foci that we'll uh, take a look at. And what we'll see is existing scholarship that points out, you know, a large number of these organizations being established uh, in the early 20th century, in the first uh, uh, two decades of the 20th century, from uh, different uh, places in uh, the former Ottoman Empire, uh, places that overlap with contemporary Turkey, uh, as early as 1907, we'll see, and then through uh, and into uh, the early uh, 20s. Okay. Now, to understand the philanthropic activities, the ways in which Mikrasiate acted in favor of their uh, struggling brethren, we have to understand, first and foremost, who we're talking about here. Right? Um, so one of the things that I'm going to do in, this com in the coming slides is uh, provide for you some information, some context uh, for the identity of these individuals. Okay? Uh, and we'll look at the ways in which that identity was socially constructed by looking at migrant categorization by the U.S. government through government documents and immigration uh, passenger lists, and then also external categorization by their peer groups and self-categorization. And what we'll use to do that is 36 oral histories with uh, second and third generation uh, descendants of these migrants, uh, as well as key excerpts from uh, the National Herald, the Ethnicos uh, Kirikas. Okay, so to begin, how did the U.S. government categorize these migrants? Well, uh, we begin this part of uh, understanding identity and the social construction of identity by looking at the Dictionary of Races and Peoples. And what we see in the Dictionary of Races and Peoples is a differentiation of Greeks from Ottoman and from Turks uh, based upon uh, language, primarily, that's what the Dictionary of Races and Peoples uh, use to categorize migrants. Uh, I should say that you know, this is a report that was, that was part of the Commission of an Immigration that was set up by President Roosevelt in 1907. Um, and in the Dictionary of Races and Peoples, what we see is the categoriz categorization of Greeks as Aryan or white, okay? Uh, and then the, uh, the categorization of Turks as Mongolian, uh, and finally, the, the erasure of Ottomans, okay? Uh, so I, I've, what I've done here for you is extracted that, the, that part of the dictionary, and what we see um, characteristically for Ottoman is the description see Turkish, okay? And I sort of put that together for you, and if you, if you look at Turkish, you actually have 
sort of an explanation, a broader explanation of what, we, of what the um, scholars, the scientists of the time that were involved in the construction of this dictionary for the Immigration Commission, um, what they meant by, by the term Turk, right? Um, and what they meant should come as no surprise based upon the politics of the time in the United States. Um, you know, Turkey was not seen very favorably, uh, and the idea of uh, Turkish people being seen as Mo Mongolian within a U.S. context was not uncommon, okay? Um, incorrectly so, I would say, but not uncommon. So what we see uh, in, the de in the definition here is also an attempt to deal with this difference between uh, uh, Ottoman, what Ottoman means, and what Turkish means, and sort of what, the di what those differences are. Uh, and the relegation of, of the term Ottoman as um, esoteric to sort of the politics of uh, Turkey, of Turkey, and that was the term that was used, or the Ottoman Empire, um, and uh, that relegation involved sort of the United, the, the, um, the recommendation by the Commission's report to not use the term uh, Ottoman in official government documents, to sort of make a preference for Turkish instead, or Turk instead, okay? That was the, the sort of the final uh, recommendation. Um, okay, so how does this actually translate to reality, or does it translate at all? Uh, and ultimately, what is the impact on migrants coming to the United States uh, from uh, the Ottoman Empire during this time? Well, um, about a decade prior to, give or take, a decade prior to the uh, publication of the Dictionary of Races and Peoples by the Immigration Commission, um, two agents, migration agents, at the Port of New York took it upon themselves to create a list of terms that would be used to, categor to categorize uh, migrants. And this was a very rudimentary list at first, just a few names, a few labels uh, for these categories. But it grew in size cons uh, uh, considerably over the first decade of the 20th century. And when the commission report was released, it was accentuated even further to what you see here. And what you're seeing here, the list of races and peoples that I've provided for you, is actually from a passenger list that was used to document migrants entering the United States in the first two decades uh, of uh, the 20th century. Okay, and you, what you can see here, if you look closely, is here is Greek, and here is Turkish, but what's missing? Anybody? Ottoman, right. Ottoman is not here, purposefully. Okay, what happened to Ottoman? Well, you, we know what happened to Ottoman. The, actual, the Immigration Commission uh, actually went out and, you know, m made the recommendation that it would be excluded from official government documents. Okay, and that's why we don't see it. But do we really not see it? Okay, so in the passenger lists, uh, there are two categories for nationality and race. And what I've selected for you here is, is actually a very rare thing to see in the passenger list. Some passenger lists, I'm, not, I'm sort of researching this still, uh, were translated into Greek as well. Okay, so it's not entirely clear when this started and how many uh, uh, passenger lists were translated into Greek as well. But uh, here you go. Ethnikotis and ipikotis for nationality and country which, uh, of which citizen or subject, and then race or people, fili, okay? Um, the majority of the passenger lists I've looked at uh, do not have this translation. So it is very rare to see these categories translated into Greek. And I did look at quite a few passenger lists. Um, so I, I've collected, as part of my research, uh, 2,000, 246 individual migrant records. Uh, these are part of a random sample that I did, did some statistic, statistical analysis on. Uh, and what I found was that for nationality and race, the majority of migrants in the sample uh, that I looked at had a, a frequency of 521, approximately 24% of the sample 
uh, listed the nationality as Turkish and race Greek. Then the second sort of uh, in, in um, line here were other, a variety of nationalities and races. Uh, and third in line, Greek nationality, Greek race. Okay, so 19%, uh, give or take. Uh, but take a look at here what's happening. Ottoman Greek shows up. Okay, it, it actually is in the passenger lists. Very low frequency, all right, low percentage, but it's there. So this kind of shows that the agents, the migration agents at the borders, and specifically here we're looking at uh, Ellis Island, so New York City, um, were documenting people according to what they were seeing uh, as proof of uh, migration. And what was the proof of migration at the time? Well, migration papers um, that we would consider passports today, but did not sort of have the sophistication of today's passports, okay? So there, there were documents that were used at the time uh, to, um, doc to uh, include information about the person's place of origin, their name, uh, sort of their, their date of birth, and what was their, ult you know, their ultimate destination. Uh, but it wasn't as official as... Uh, a contemporary uh, passport. Um, so those documents were used at the port of embarkation to record nationality and race. And, and in a very low percentage, the migration agents at Ellis Island did document Ottoman as uh, a nationality. Okay? They also documented Turkish as a nationality uh, and race. Now. You might be looking at all of this information and saying, wait a minute, the, you know, sa the same labels are getting used for, this, for different things. How can you be you know, Turkish na of Turkish nationality and, 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 and Turkish race? I mean, a Turk Turk does that even make sense? Or a, an Ottoman Greek or, a, you know, how do these, how do these uh, different labels make sense? And, and to understand that, you have to understand something about what I uh, said in the previous slide, social construction of identity, okay? Uh, so what do I mean by that in this context? What we're seeing is race as a dominant paradigm, uh, identity paradigm during this time period in American history. Okay, 100% uh, ideas such as 100% Americanism, nativism, okay, uh, uh, social Darwinism, and biological racism were the science of this time, um, and uh, it was not uncommon to think of Greek or Turk, the, these labels, as racial categories, okay, as national categories. Uh, it made sense to, uh, in this context during this time. Um, okay, so having sort of an understanding of, you know, the overall numbers here, how many are being, how many uh, individual migrants are being labeled uh, as Turkish Greek versus Greek Greek versus Ottoman Greek or Turkish Turkish, um, in addition to other uh, categories here. Uh, I think another thing I'd like us to look at is an interesting um, phenomenon that emerged during my documentation of this information. And that is what I call the switch variable. Okay, so uh, switches that occurred in people's nationalities during the documentation process, okay? Uh, how did they occur? Well, I'll go back to it in a minute, but quite literally, somebody took a pen and crossed out Ottoman and wrote over it, okay? Uh, and I'm not really sure where this happened, whether it happened uh, at, the, at the port of embarkation or it happened uh, at Ellis Island or somewhere on the, along the way, I would argue it's not really important where it happened. Just the fact that it did happen shows the intent, the intention of that agent, of that migration agent, or perhaps that um, purser on the ship, or whoever did this, right, uh, did it so as to erase Ottoman from the record, right, and replace it with another label. And in this case, the label is Turkish, but the, the majority sort of switches that occur in the sample that I looked at were from Ottoman Greek to Turkish Greek, okay? 
So again, there is a concerted effort to erase Ottoman from the migration documentation uh, uh, data that was being collected. Okay. Um, another interesting switch that was occurring okay, from uh, Greek to Turkish. Okay, so you would have uh, individuals you know, um, uh, identified as Greek nationality and Greek race, and they would be switched to Turkish nationality and Greek race. Okay, so that, that also uh, occurred. Uh, and then there, there are some others here that I sort of uh, put, uh, added uh, to contextualize uh, this phenomenon. Okay. All right, so we do see evidence of you know, the U.S. government uh, creating this standard in the Dictionary of Races and Peoples, making this recommendation, saying, you know, Ottoman should not be used, we should replace it with, Tur with Turkish, and then we see it happening in real life. There's people who are agents of the U.S. government, perhaps, or persons on the ship who are beholden to agents of the U.S. government that are erasing Ottoman from the record. Okay. All right, now, uh, okay. So the next thing I I'd like us to look at is external categorization of peer groups. This will, I believe this sort of help us, helps us understand why the U.S. government would be interested in erasing Ottoman from the record, uh, why um, you know, Turkish would be seen in the way that it was seen in the Dictionary of Races as, or Peoples as Mongolian, as inferior. Um, so to, to understand that, like I said, what I did was uh, interview uh, 36 descendants of um, immigrants from the Ottoman Empire, uh, second and third generation descendants. Uh, and in the majority of uh, cases, what I found uh, when I questioned them was that their uh, ancestors, grandparents uh, usually, would identify, uh, would be identified rather by their peer groups as either Greeks or Micrasiates or Prostiges. These were sort of the, the main categories, okay? Um, However, another category that emerged uh, in, this, in this sample of 36 uh, descendants uh, is this idea of the mad Turk, savage Turk, uh, an individual who can't control their emotions. Um, also, these might look familiar to audience members, Turkophony or Turkospori. These were also labels that were used by their peer groups. In the U.S. now, we're talking about, right? Uh, not in a Greek context, in a U.S. context, right? Uh, they were called not Greek, as you'll hear in a minute, and also not white. Okay, this, this emerged uh, in the sample uh, as well. So uh, let's have a listen of and, and sort of hear what this sounded like uh, from the recollections uh, of their descendants. They were Turkofona. They could only speak Turkish because in the province they were from, they had a choice, either lose your religion or lose your language. So most of them said, we're going to lose the language, we're still going to stay Orthodox. So they came here, they go to the church, but they're speaking Turkish. And people are saying, what are, what are they doing here? Shouldn't they be in a mosque? Well, they understood what they were saying. You know, that offended some people. There was a guy in Carnahan called Big John. He was like the, the president of Carnahan, O Proedros. You know, and he was a big man too. And whenever there was a problem, people always went to Big John. And they said Big John pointed to everybody and called them out and said, and he said, we're going on the other side of town and we're going to start our own congregation. Now, is that written anywhere? No, but these are oral stories that, of course, through time, people might add a little bit more to it. But when you look at our charter, all five uh, signing members were all from Asia Minor. They're all Pontian. And they went to the Black Sea Coffee House on Carnahan Avenue on Easter Sunday, and there was a lot of heated debate there. Two days later, the charter was signed, and the Holy Trinity started. So there's a lot of different stories flying about. I just ran into a man uh, uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, he's a member of our church. And I asked him, did you know that story? He said, no, but I heard this. He said when there was Greek Independence Day, when they would meet at the hall down on the southeast end of town, uh, it was Greek Independence Day, they were doing a parade down there, and a Pontian held up the Greek flag, and somebody said, why is this Turk holding up the Greek flag? Why is this Turk holding up the Greek flag? All right, so we see here the utilization of you know, uh, 
the label of Turk as inferior, right? Um, you heard a, a congregation split in half, literally, uh, not because of politics, okay? Not because of Venizelists or monarchists, but because some folks in a congregation were seen as Turk, not Greek, okay? Um, so uh, the last sort of aspect to this is the not white part, right? Um, and what we see here, it, um, excuse me, we sort of um, back, to backtrack a little bit, I also wanted to point out that this, uh, this idea of turcophony and turcospori um, also uh, appears in the National Herald. Uh, my apologies. Uh, I didn't want to um, miss out on this particular aspect of uh, the utilization of, uh, uh, of these terms. Uh, so we have Michael Brujos here writing in 1919 that Μετά μεγάλης μας λύπης βλέπουμε εμείς οι μετασιάτες Έλληνες ότι μερικοί εκ των αδελφών Ελλήνων της Παλαιάς Ελλάδος εκφράζονται σκεός και ειρηνικός πως διημάς τους μικρασιάτες Έλληνες υποκαλούντος ημάς τουρκόφωνους κλπ. So, uh, he goes on to say that, you know, this is... Uh, this is not right, you know, uh, we should not be called this, because we are more Greek than they are, okay? Uh, he says this in many, uh, in many words. Uh, and I, I'm gonna cir- I wanted to circle back to that uh, in a minute. So I, I just wanted to point out that uh, this was not found just in the uh, recollections of descendants of migrants. This was also found in, contem- in contemporaneous records. People in newspapers wrote and complained to the editor uh, that this was happening to them in their community and that it should not happen because it's not right. Uh, now, the not white part is something I wanted to touch upon, and I do so in my work quite a bit. Um, I, I uh, try to contextualize it within an anti-immigrant white supremacist discourse. Uh, this uh, you know, concept, what it looks at is a variety of immigrant groups, not just Ottoman Greeks. Uh, but what, it, what I argue with this uh, concept uh, is that white supremacy is ultimately the, the source uh, of this superiority that people use uh, to make others feel inferior, to target them as inferior, in this case to target uh, people coming from the Ottoman Empire uh, and uh, position them as inferior to Greeks, uh, Greek migrants in a U.S. context, okay? Um, and we, we sort of hear this play out um, in the recollections of, uh, d- of um, uh, the descendants. Um, but we don't also s- see this uh, targeting of um, Ottoman Greeks occur as, mi- as migrants, but also of Greek migrants as well in a U.S. context, so much so uh, that they uh, construct, socially construct, a Greek destig- destigmatization discourse, right? Greek migrants during this time are evoking ancient Greek civilization, democracy, philosophy, uh, Greek uh, history uh, as the... Um, basis and connection points of American culture, of American history, of American civilization, okay? And they do so by uh, evoking uh, connections to ancient Greece, okay? So uh, this idea we see in newspaper, uh, you know, renditions such as this one, uh, where ancient Greek and and, uh, modern Greek meet, right? Uh, And it is these sort of narratives and images that are used uh, to appease the white American population. Okay, so individuals who uh, are Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, have been uh, in the United States uh, for multiple generations. Uh, this, is, this discourse sort of speaks to them, and what it tries to do is increase proximity of those Greek migrants to whiteness and to American whiteness uh, specifically. Okay, now... At the same time that this is happening, an Ottoman Greek destigmatization discourse is uh, emerging. So remember Michael Brukos that I, Brujos that I just mentioned uh, a few seconds ago? Uh, well, he goes on in his uh, op-ed 
uh, to state that the Greek migrants themselves in Greece, and sort of the Greek people uh, more generally speaking, and, and more specifically the Greek Department of Education, has failed to cleanse itself and to cleanse Athens of the Albanian language, right? And that this is sort of a, a stain on, on Greek education, right? So how, who are they to blame, you know, 5% of the Ottoman Greek population for, for speaking Turkish still, they are still, uh, they are still under the quote-unquote yoke of the Ottoman uh, Empire, right? Um, so through this verbiage, what Brujos tries to do is, uh, in the end, argue that it's just a matter of time, you know, the um, uh, Asia Minorite language will be cleansed of all Turkish elements uh, and will be wholly Greek uh, within the next Ten, within the next decade, according to his, uh, to his view. So, uh, and ultimately, you know, both uh, uh, Ottoman Greeks, both, uh, excuse me, both new Greeks, as he puts them, and old Greeks uh, will be one. And uh, you sort of have to understand that new Greece was seen as the lands in uh, the Ottoman Empire at the time, and old Greece was seen as uh, the Greek kingdom uh, at the time. Okay, so... Uh, do we see any evidence for this discourse, the Ottoman Greek destigmatization discourse, in uh, uh, any of the uh, recollections of uh, the descendants? Uh, I would argue that we do, and I, I'm going to play a little clip for you that I think speaks to it. Well, Mr. Garciati had uh, a special uh, significance. I don't know if you heard the beginning of that, so I'm going to play it again, okay? Sorry. Well, Mr. Garciati had uh, a special uh, significance. Um, there was a, a certain pride, and through your studies, you probably have realized that uh, even Greece became a city after 1922, when the Asia Minor, when the Migrasiati, with their culture, came into what was Athens. You've probably come across that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, it was a, they were a different breed of cat. They considered themselves, I would, I, I think, they considered themselves uh, a head above them. They were a, dif a different breed of cat, right? Uh, they consider themselves to be ahead of both. These, these are the, the words that were used at the time in the early 20th century, these ideas of superiority to try to, to emphasize, you know, that Ottoman, the Ottoman Greek culture, Ottoman Greek people uh, were, were better than the Greeks. You know, they, they had a claim to superiority in, in one sense or another. Um, and what we see time after time, and if you follow my work, uh, perhaps you've seen this online, too. Quite often, when I post something that is related to the research that I'm doing, there will be a response below it about the term that I use, um, specifically use for the project, the Ottoman Greeks of the U.S. Digital History Project. Um, quite often, people will stop and correct the name. And when they correct the name, this is the type of... The, the Ottoman Greek destigmatization discourse is what they use to defend the Greekness of uh, these migrants in a U.S. context, okay? So it continues to live on. It's not something that's in the past. It's not something that has been forgotten about or just in the, the recollections of descendants. You know, people, as I'm sure you know here in Greece as well, but in the United States, uh, this has certainly emerged also. Um, and um, I think it fits within this concept of uh, destigmatization, right? Because if you're feeling targeted uh, by Greeks, by white Americans, uh, you know, sort of one of, a very human reaction is to defend yourself, right, and, and to defend yourself by claiming superiority in some sense um, is what we see. Okay, last but not least, this idea of whiteness that I mentioned, not white, okay, so uh, one of the things that, we, that I see in my uh, research is that American whiteness 
is claimed via primordial Greekness. Okay, so what I mean by that, the, the image that you saw earlier of you know, the, the ancient Greek warrior sort of making a connection to the modern Greek uh, warrior, uh, or um, ideas about you know, Greek democracy, Greek philosophy, uh, and the importance of all those, what Ottoman Greek migrants do is they, they, they grab a hold of that, right? And they claim it for themselves, and they use it in such a way so as to circumvent the, uh, uh, the inferiority that, that these groups are trying to bestow on them, and uh, they do so in such a way so as to claim American whiteness. Okay, we are Greek, and therefore we are white, right? That's the idea here, and that's the, that is how, uh, uh, that is the language, rather, that they use uh, in order to increase their proximity to American uh, whiteness. So, um, do we have any evidence of this that I can present for you? Of course. He was this Greek from the mainland who looked down. All right, I'm going to play it for you from the beginning. One more time. Sorry, the sound is just a little off. He was this Greek from the mainland who looked down on the Ottoman Greeks. Oh, you know, he knew who they were. And he ended up saying, you got to wait and go in the back door. I'm not letting people like you in here. The people from Alatsata were not considered true Greeks. When they went to, when, when they went to Athens, they were looked down upon. So there was a guy at mainland Greek who thought he was a true Greek, and that the people from Alatsta, and this was probably in 19, late 1930s. Okay. He thought that the Alatsta Jani and all the people from Asia Minor were skata and didn't need to go in. You know, he, he had to make sure he went in, sort of like uh, uh, in the South, you know, they had a door for the whites and a door for the blacks. Sort of like in the South, door for the whites, the Greeks, and a door for the blacks, the Ottoman Greeks. Okay, so you see, in a U.S. in a U.S. context, it goes beyond this idea of nationality, ethnicity. It be, it becomes racialized, right? These labels become racialized, and I, I think this is an important uh, uh, quote. I use it quite often because I think it, it really hits home as to the ways in which this racialization from the early 20th century continues to persevere to the present, okay? Uh, into the 30s and uh, to, to today, okay? So uh, quite often what we see in uh, external categorization by, uh, uh, excuse me, less often <laughs> what we see in external categorization by peer groups is this um, American, Greek American, or white uh, uh, label, okay? Uh, it did exist, it was used, but you know, ultimately, not as much as uh, Greeks, Mikrasiates or Prosphiges, or um, uh, unfortunately, uh, these uh, sort of labels uh, that hearken to uh, an anti-immigrant white supremacist discourse. Okay. All right. Now, as far as self-categorization is concerned, not that much different. Okay. Uh, there are, in the research that I've done, uh, I did ask the descendants uh, to, to sort of convey to me the ways in which their ancestors would self-identify to their peer groups, to their family members, to friends. Uh, and what we see once again is uh, labels such as Greek, Mikrasiates, definitely not Ottoman and not Turk uh, being used. And then localism appears quite often. You heard the term Alatsatyani, right? Marmarini. But also, interestingly enough, uh, the Turkish labels persist, persisted. So Konyanli, right? Uh, Lazi, Pondi. Uh, another uh, uh, set of labels, right? localism, so uh, local, regional labels, local labels, cities, towns, villages uh, would, be, would be used quite often, but definitely not Ottoman or Turk, right? Okay. Um, another one is Prosphias, okay? Uh, and quite proudly sometimes that this would be used with a sense of pride, right? And sometimes with lamentation. Right, like oh, we were poor, 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 Um and then so Turkey, and now we're oh, Americans. Me. And then and last, yes, they might describe sorry. themselves as Greek. That shouldn't be playing. Uh, and then they lastly, out of their heritage, that shouldn't be playing. <laughs> and then lastly, out of their Lastly, white or American. Okay, the the clip that's really trying to play here 
uh, is one that sort of summarizes all of this. Okay, um, it summarizes uh, self-categorization through the through the uh, memories of a uh, descendant, the ways in which his grandparents sort of uh, identified uh, to uh, their peer groups according to his recollections. Religion. But they didn't have much affinity for the modern. All right, I'll play it from the beginning. They were proud of their heritage. They valued their religion. But they didn't have much affinity for the modern Greek state. They, 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 you know, they didn't associate with it. That wasn't their land. <laughs> that wasn't their roots. You know? And to them, it was, OK, we know our roots in Turkey, and now we're Americans. And yes, they might describe themselves as Greek, but you know, it was like a lot of them just cut their ties with Greece. Period. So, yeah, they they describe themselves as Greeks, right? I think this this particular quote I think is pretty typical. I want to say typical, but exemplary for sure, right? Like, yeah, they they connected with Greece in some ways, but really localism was salient, right? Whenever they were in their in their peer groups, it was about their village, you know, it was about their where they were from, their town. That that heritage was resonated more uh, uh, than anything else. Okay, so sort of close out or begin to close out uh, my talk. Um, one of the very first things that came across my research when I started out uh, uh, was organizations that they set up. Uh, as soon as they arrived to the United States, as early as 1907, in fact, um, there's indications that Marmarini uh, in Los Angeles uh, organized themselves into a mutual aid society. Uh, and what we, what we see is activities such as uh, cross-border networking. So this is where uh, migration network theory comes in that I mentioned earlier as a, con as a concept, right? Um, friends, relatives, helping people migrate, helping them settle, helping them find jobs. Uh, so cross-border networking, these organizations would actually help migrants um, move to a particular city or state in the U.S. Um, so for example, uh, the Marmarini that I just brought up in Los Angeles, they had uh, uh, chapters in Constantinople, uh, in New York, in Los Angeles, in Seattle, in Portland, and they all had connections with one another and spoke to one another through uh, correspondence. So if you know, a particular migrant wanted to leave Marmara, the island of Marmara, uh, if you're not familiar with sort of the area, this is in the Sea of Marmara, right across, very near uh, Constantinople. Uh, so, you know, they would sort of connect through these organizations from Constantinople to New York. Do you have anybody there who could, you know, uh, you know find a job for this person and, you know, have them settle? Anything? No? Okay, how about the Los Angeles chapter? Okay, okay, well, maybe Seattle or Portland. And they would sort of work together to bring people and provide jobs for them and settle them in uh, their community. Uh, which was also very important, community building activities. Okay, so uh, they would spend time with one another at meetings, playing cards sometimes. Um, you know, they would party together, birthday parties, yortes, name days. Um, and in addition to that, they would uh, also participate uh, in you know, theater performances. They would organize theater performances, as we'll see. Uh, and they would uh, try to bring the community together in many different ways to sort of s sustain some connection. Uh, they also had commemorative activities, so you heard earlier March 25th mentioned. Uh, we'll see a, a, another example soon. Um, but uh, more lamentful commemorations, so for example, um, when the uh, town of Maditos was destroyed, right? Uh, the Maditians in New York had a commemorative event uh, for the destruction of Maditos in New York City. Okay. And this brought the community together uh, in a commemorative uh, sense. And then the part that sort of you know, uh, brought this presentation to you tonight, <laughs> the philanthropic component, uh, for which you know, uh, I am so grateful to have connected here with the Gennadios Library and the American uh, Classical School in Athens, is the philanthropic uh, component. Um, and uh, this philanthropy was, uh, you know, it was individualistic, so individuals would, do, would send funds to help uh, through Near East Relief and through other organizations, but then also these organizations, Ottoman Greek organizations, uh, would participate uh, as groups. So they would, 
They hold fundraisers, as you'll see. They would hold theaters and performances, and they would collect the money, and then they would send it back uh, to Marmara, to Zmirna, to Constantinople, uh, to help the communities uh, there. So what I'd like to do is sort of through the voices of the descendants themselves, I'd like to give you an example uh, of one of these organizations, the uh, Marmarini in Los Angeles, and sort of their activities and uh, the importance of uh, their activities uh, in, philanthropic, uh, uh, in a philanthropic sense. The Marmarino uh, Benevolent Society of Afoni. It started um, officially in 1909, uh, but that was its incorporation date. Uh, in, but it was a date on the stamp and everything they had, but it actually existed since 1904, prior. And uh, there was a big Mamarino organization that predates it for the whole island, but then our chapter, since everyone came from Afoni specifically, came there. The initial members were basically all of our relatives. We had regular correspondence with uh, Seattle, Washington, Tacoma, Washington, Portland, Oregon, and early on New York. And I know our relatives from even Hempstead and, uh, and later Queens uh, were part of it, but the New York one we lost contact with. The other ones, there's still some contact. It was a mutual assistance for the Mamarini back in Mamara proper. Uh, it was also a, a way to uh, find uh, jobs and a place to live and think for uh, the people coming from Afoni here and that and trying to help them get started. And uh, it later, as you know, after the population exchange, it uh, became more to provide burial services for members and a school and the library, which became really important for them. The first community library here was all from Mamara. And um, assistance for the Mamarini that were prosvi in Greece. And that, and that assistance um, continued through the building of the church in uh, Ios Dimitrios uh, in Pergadikia uh, within that end the uh, shipping of uh, everything from foods to clothing to things continued through all of that time. So it was a mutual assistance, mutual aid society. We would always have uh, uh, events, the annual picnic, uh, a dinner dance, uh, and smaller gatherings when they just would go to a park somewhere. And uh, 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 they would even have summer beach parties where everybody would go together and it looked like a little village because they'd put all the umbrellas up together <laughs> and then go in in Long Beach actually. The picnics were all at Legion Park downtown by Dodger Stadium today. Uh, always there was like the consistent one and even though there were Easter picnics and these big murals of pictures of them, uh, they were all dressed really well and the picnics were always after church. Uh, so you went to the picnic dressed in your church best. Even the beach parties, you see the men in their suits with their pants rolled up in the water. <laughs> but they were fairly frequent. You know, besides the Easter and the holiday ones, uh, they would get together routinely from that. There was like a monthly meeting and usually the meeting would adjourn into a social or card playing or something after. Okay, so you, you heard the, the, um, uh, the speaker here talk about picnics. What I'm going to do now is, for the first time ever, show you what one of these picnics looked like. Um, this is the uh, Brotherhood of Alatsatkins in Somerville, Massachusetts, the Faros of Eritrea. And um, you, what you're going to get to see here is the ways in which these picnics brought community, the community together.
Um, this could have been any picnic, right, up until the end. This could have been any picnic from any organization. And as I watched this video the, for the first time when I saw it, I said, well, this doesn't look like, you know, the photos of anything. But then in the end, I don't know if you noticed, and I actually dubbed the music on it, they were, dan they were dancing the Aptalico Zaybekiko, which I've been told is the national anthem of Alatzatians worldwide. Uh, so uh, this, you know, there is evidence here for this absolutely being, um, you know, a picnic from the Faros of Eritrea, according to the, to the descendants as well who, who donated it. Um, but that dance is very characteristic from that, that part of, uh, uh, of the world. Uh, so I'd like to close out with examples of philanthropic activities. Uh, we have the Silogos Preconision Omar Maras in New York City. This is the, the chapter that, we, that the descendant talked about in his recollections. Uh, and we see here um, in New York, uh, you know, the, the uh, Silogos, the organization, um, you know, doing a fundraiser for St. Helens Hospital uh, in Athens, Greece, and uh, donating the equivalent of what today would be 14,000 euros. Okay, so this is, this is no small amount. Uh, for immigrants who are settling uh, in New York uh, during this time. Uh, I mentioned earlier plays or, phil you know, phil educational uh, activities. The, the Silogos uh, Alatateon Ofaras de Seritreas did organize a theater uh, performance such as this and uh, used those funds to support uh, the, the school in the community, the Greek school in, in the community. Uh, the Fraternity of Rodopolitans, Trapezudians, and Kumunini in New York City um, also for full educational support of, chil of the children of Santa, so Sad Sadda in northeastern Turkey, uh, did a fundraiser and connected, collected 48,000 euro, the equivalent of 48,000 euro, and sent this money to Sadda in northeastern Turkey. There's actually correspondence between the organization and the, arch the bishop there in Sanda uh, receiving uh, the funds. Okay, so that is... Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. This has been a long presentation. I apologize uh, for that, uh, but thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, I would entertain them at this point. Hey, Yorgo, thank you very much uh, for a very rich presentation. Uh, of course, I'm privileged to have uh, sort of looked uh, at your work and, and gone through your work very carefully when we were putting together the exhibition. Uh, but um, I, I, I think it's, uh, to me, it was quite impressive. I mean, the different components and parts uh, that uh, you pulled together. Um, are there any questions? Um, can I start with a, with a very specific question that I have online? Uh, what was the name of the uh, Alatsatian dance? My great-grandmother is from Alatsata, so I would love to know. Alatsata, I guess. I would, she would love to know. I, I've been told that it, it's the Aptalico Zeybekiko. Aptalico Zeybekiko. Okay. <laughs> Kiria Bur. the associations of Alatsatiani, Marmarini. Um, I understand there were others. They were from, from, all, from all over the, the, the Asia Minor immigrant areas where the Greeks immigrated. There were others. Do they survive today, any of these uh, Siloji? I know the Pontians, for example, still exist, but are there uh, associations that still exist from the old Asia by Mikrasiatiki Silogi? That's a great question, yeah. Thank so you. you're, you're very right. You know, there's, there's, uh, uh, or, there were organizations, uh, not only from Asia Minor, but from Eastern Thrace, from the islands in the Sea of Marmara, Invros, Tenedos as well. Um, and uh, yeah, to my knowledge, uh, they, uh, some do survive. They, they don't survive perhaps in, you know, the same tenacity that they did in the early 20th century. Um, but, you know, I, I could provide, you know, besides the Pondian organizations and the, the Pondian Federation, um, you know, there, there are examples such as the Imvrians, the Ivriotis, uh, um, who have a chapter in New York that I'm aware of. Um, the Marmarini in Los Angeles, you know, still sort of uh, have a presence 
Um, uh, the Faros of Eritrea as well uh, has a, sort of has a presence, uh, uh, but like I said, it's not to, in the same uh, with the same tenacity that it was uh, back then. Those are the ones that are sort of st sticking on my mind uh, at the moment. I don't mean to leave anybody out. <laughs> Τα στοιχεία που έχετε συγκεντρώσει για τους πρόσφυγες είναι μετά το 1922, η πρώτη ερώτηση. Και γνωρίζουμε ότι όσοι πηγαίναν στην Αμερική είχαν κάποιο σύνδεσμο. Οι σύλλογοι αυτοί που αναφέρετε λειτουργήσαν ως σύνδεσμο για να πάνε εκεί. Και αν ναι, πριν το 1922 ή μετά. Αυτό. No. Uh, can, can I try to translate? <laughs> so the question was whether you some uh, most of your data come from before 22, and the other one whether the people who arrived, I mean, had some kind of um, contact person where they were going at. Do it in English so that uh, people who watch us. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the, da the, the data that I've accumulated uh, sort of str uh, straddles 1922. There's information from pre-1922 uh, that comes from not only the recollections of uh, the descendants, uh, but also from the newspaper, uh, archi the archival information, um, photographs, documents, uh, uh, diaries, um, you know, these sort of straddle that date. Uh, and then there's information after 1922 as well, so both before and after. Um, did they have connections? Yes, absolutely. There's in the um, uh, so you heard. Um, I think it was the, in the very early in the presentation. Uh, um, Big John, you know, O Proedros uh, was mentioned in Canton, Ohio. There were similar sort of figureheads or individuals, um, male, female. You know, it wasn't. You know, that wasn't a distinguishing factor that played a role in helping. Uh, migrants sort of connect and go to a particular um, town or city in the United States from their point of origin. Um, w was that always the case? No. You know, there, there's also a lot of evidence of people, you know, taking what they have and sort of doing their best to settle where they could. Um, so uh, it wasn't just the organizations that sort of played a role in, in helping people uh, settle. There were individuals. This was an individualistic process as well. Um, individuals would do this. They would, you know, take whatever money they could or whatever money perhaps their their family could afford them uh, as well and travel to to settle in the U.S. Hmm? I have heard that Archbishop Jacobos has helped. I have heard that Archbishop Jacobos coming from Imvros has helped a lot of people. Is that true to your knowledge? Yeah, so to my knowledge that, that you know, that he is from Imvros for sure, yeah, and that um, he played a role in sort of helping migrants um, um, uh, settle in the United States, there, there is evidence for that, yeah. Uh, beyond, it's a little beyond the scope of sort of my research, but um, chronologically speaking, uh, but yeah. There, yeah, yeah, there is evidence for that, you yeah. Uh, Archbishop Iacobos, interestingly enough, um, um, he, he intersects my work in many different ways. That's one way. The other way he intersects my work is um, sort of his courage in um, marching with Martin Luther King Jr. at Selma. Uh, that was a really powerful moment and sort of um, I evoke that uh, in my research and in my book, um, sort of exemplary of uh, um, you know, what, what um, whiteness should be. I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but uh, you brought up Yakovos, and that's another, that's another way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, thank you very much for a very rich presentation, uh, impressive data. Thank you. Um, well, I'm not sure whether uh, all these uh, self-identifications changed through time, because um, you mentioned Migrasiate, Greeks, and uh, Prosphyes. But I'm wondering whether 1922 was not a really 
a, a big change in self-identification. Uh, people who arrived in, uh, in the US before um, the exchange of populations, uh, did they define themselves as prosphias? Uh, or is it because you uh, rely mainly on oral history that you have recollections that don't, don't respond to how people themselves were defining, I mean, uh, um, immigrants coming to the US at that time themselves. So, and how did, did this change through time? Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, because it gives me an opportunity to actually uh, uh, touch upon uh, a key factor in my um, uh, questionnaire, which is I, I ask about 1922. I ask, you know, when did they arrive? You know, did they arrive pre-1922 or post-1922? Do you know? Um, and uh, what happens, depending on where, you're, where they're from, so let's say they're from uh, Western Asia Minor, uh, they talk about two expulsions, right? Uh, they talk about the expulsion during World War I, uh, where they were forced to leave as refugees uh, from Western Asia Minor um, and move to the United States. Uh, and, they talk about, and then they talk about the second expulsion, which is 1922, where they either were, the, were not there for that, or they went back and were expelled a second time as, as refugees. And uh, the first time they settled you know, um, temporarily in the nearby islands, the neighboring islands in, in Greece, um, and then the second time they left and went to the United States. Uh, but the, the cohort that left, the group of people, that left as a result of the first, expul the first expulsion, um, you know, they identified as, as refugees as well, as, prof as prosecutors as well. Now, um, for those that uh, arrived prior to World War I, uh, there's always sort of a distinction. They, they won't necessarily use refugee as a label. Uh, they, the, the, the people who uh, I, the descendants who I interviewed are sort of specific about the fact that their ancestors arrived with uh, arrived, um, they were not expelled. It was like their choice to leave. Uh, and I actually talk about this in my research, that not everybody was a refugee. Uh, you know, uh, quite a few people left previous, prior to uh, World War I, um, and they, they left with a certain amount of wealth or opportunity to settle. You know, they, had, they sort of had the means to make the trip and uh, the, the opportunity perhaps to be more successful in settling in the United States as a, as a result. And they're usually the ones that will uh, also evoke uh, localism. Everybody does, but they sort of leave out the prosphias part. They're like, well, we weren't, we weren't prosphias. You know, we, we, we left with things. You know, we, nobody kicked us out. We left because we wanted to. Uh, you know, we left for better opportunities. Uh, so that does happen. Uh, in this sample of uh, descendants that I've, uh, that I've interviewed. And that sort of um, touches upon the difference in chronologies. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of this pre-World pre War I cohort, World War I cohort, um, and then pre-1922, post-1922 cohort. There's a post-1922 cohort as well. Uh, individuals who came to Greece and settled here uh, or remained in the Ottoman Empire uh, in Constantinople, in Imbros, and, and a few in Tenedos, and ultimately they left thereafter. That, that also happens. Um, so those are sort of the chronological time points that, I can, that, that I've identified in the, through the interviews. Thank you very much for a <clears throat> very interesting talk. I have two questions. One is about the class aspect of all this. Uh, I wondered where, uh, from which classes, from which types of occupations were these people coming from? And um, also about uh, your comment on um, appreciating ancient Greek uh, history and representing it as part of your identity. This might be related uh, maybe also with the education and the class aspect rather than from where one was coming from, uh, from um, Greece or um, from the Ottoman Empire. Um, one is this one. The second one is related to the role of the church. That is, um, 
I saw in one of your photos, um, uh, I think a pastor, Protestant clergyman was sitting. Uh, so these people were um, also, they were coming from maybe different denominations as uh, Greeks, but also some were um, the ones who were coming from Greece. Um, they were, um, they had a different church than the ones uh, in the Ottoman Empire. They were um, the adherents of the uh, patriarchate. So I wondered what uh, these, how these divisions uh, could have played a role in their um, identities, social construction of their identities. Okay, yeah, that's a, those are both uh, great questions. So um, just to, because in, in, my, in my memory, I'm now th thinking about the answer to your second question, not your first. Uh, what was your first question, though? It was about a class. Class, class. okay, yeah. So um, indications for, for, the di for differences in class, um, I um, account for both in the interviews and also in the uh, passenger list uh, data. Um, thankfully, <laughs> there was a, uh, a column for uh, occupation and education. Like, do, you know, have, have they, do they know how to speak a language, uh, for example? Um, and, you know, the majority are laborers, workers or laborers, vast majority. Um, you have, after that, artisans, much smaller percentage, um, and then very few who are like white collar professionals, doctors, lawyers, uh, and the like. Um, so the vast majority of data from the passenger list shows that they're uh, workers or laborers, um, or housekeepers. Housekeepers as well. That's a that's a category. Um, in the uh, uh, in the interviews, um, I do ask about occupation, right? Of your grandparents, of your parents, yourself, and your children. I'm trying to see. I'm trying to track upward mobility, or social mobility, in any in any sense. Um, and if I'm remembering that data correctly as well, you know, in the majority of times you see upward mobility from uh, the the grandparents to the parents to to the to the um, um, descendant the, the the interviewee the person I'm interviewing and then to their children very smaller percentage uh, experience downward mobility so um, things get worse for people's children right even though they're in a better position the person I'm interviewing has a good job you know they're doing well their kids actually don't do as well right? that's downward mobility um, so I have both sets of data. Um, um, from the interviews and the, uh, the passenger lists. Um, your second question was about the church and the role of the church. Um, other denominations, I think you mentioned. Do you mean like just patriarchy of Constantinople versus... And also Greek Protestants. Okay, yeah. Um, so this is... Uh, what I've seen in the... In the um, first of all, in the passengers list, there, there's nothing. There's no data uh, in the LSI on the archive about religion. Uh, in, the, um, uh, in the interviews, there's quite a bit of information about sort of the importance of the church as a place of, you know, um, community building, uh, where, where things happened, where people got together. Um, not mass, not liturgy, curiously, <laughs> you know, but they do talk about sort of the, the Sunday get-together after church and what would happen and sort of people being together and that being a place of, of togetherness. Um, now, the, um, the Protestant denomination does emerge, uh, particularly in the interviews that I did in the Northeast. Um, so there's a, a community in Watertown, Massachusetts, that's been studied, too. There's, like, some scholarship about it. But it also emerges in the, um, in the interviews. Uh, these are individuals who were proselytized into the Protestant faith, um, and... You know, there, many of them are from uh, northern or th northeastern uh, Turkey, would it stay Turkey? Um, and th they sort of evoke the fact that they existed and they were there and sort of that they were a separate community uh, and there weren't really connections between the two. Uh, that's the extent of it. Um, a goal of mine is to at some point have a student work on uh, individuals who came to the United States who were uh, Muslim but spoke Greek. Uh, I'm very interested to see sort of the dynamics of that. Like how did they, leaving Turkey, you know, having um, the, the uh, 
some semblance of Greek ethnicity, the Greek language, you know, the Greek culture, and then not the Greek Orthodox faith. You know, did they did they sort of uh, enter the church? Did they just, did they decide to you know switch faiths, or did they actually join a Muslim community in the U.S.? This is sort of a long-term <laughs> project for me. I'm very interested to find out if that ever happened. I mean, it, it's not in the interviews that I've done. It, ne it never comes up. So that would, that would be interesting for me to, to see if, what the, those dynamics would be. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question online. Uh, Theodora Patrona I, th thanks you for the wonderful presentation and project. And she's asking if you could elaborate on the role of women in specifically in the philanthropic activities you mentioned. Yeah, um, so quite a lot of, uh, um, many women were sort of in the leadership positions here. So they would take, they would take a, a leadership role in um, uh, organizing events uh, that were uh, uh, meant to fundraise uh, for communities in Asia Minor and Eastern Thrace and the islands. Um, uh, they also did a lot of the, the work that w was necessary for these events to take place, to, to, to be sustained, and to ultimately be successful. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're mentioned quite often in sort of the name lists that are, uh, you know, the, the, either the supporters or the, you know, the, the monetary support uh, individuals, you know, that provide the monetary support or were there sort of uh, making the whole thing happen, organizing it. Uh, they played a central role, and this is this is in the, a lot of the um, newspaper articles. Uh, their their names uh, emerge um, in the uh, interviews that I've done. Uh, yeah, I mean the Philoptoho societies in in the churches uh, certainly are are evoked uh, over and over again. Um, you know, in, uh, you have to also understand that in the early 20th century, a lot of these organizations, the Ottoman Greek organizations, were um, you know, they, like other organizations, were fraternal. Um, women were not allowed to participate. Um, you know, some of them made their own organizations that were separate, that were just for women. Sort of the women's, you know, uh, uh, organization that that uh, was uh, similar to uh, the you know the brother the brotherhood of Alatatians and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, they they did play a role in sort of the the fundraising and sustaining of. Uh, of philanthropic efforts. I, I can't see a hand, but if you've seen one, go ahead. <laughs> Is there any other question? Ευχαριστούμε τον κύριο Τοπαλίδη για την πολύ εμπεριστατωμένη παρουσίασή του. Θα απευθύνω και εγώ την ερώτηση στα ελληνικά, γιατί αισθάνομαι λίγα και άβολα, παρόλο ότι προέρχομαι εξ Ανατολών και γνωρίζοντα τι σημαίνει το παλίδι. Ε, ε, η ερώτηση μου είναι η εξή. Από τι έρευνέ σα και από αυτά τα οποία έχετε μελετήσει, ε, υπάρχουν πληροφορίε ε, ή στοιχεία. Ε, για την παράλληλη ε, πορεία των Ελληνοοθωμανών, ε, όπως τους αποκαλείται, Ottoman Greeks, και των Αρμενίων της Οθωμανικής Αυτοκρατορίας, που εγκαταστάθηκαν στην, ε, σχεδόν την ίδια περίοδο ε, στην Αμερική, και αν υπήρχε αλληλοεπίδραση μεταξύ τους, και συνεργασία, αν υπάρχουν τέτοια στοιχεία. The question is whether there is, there are connections uh, or, or, or parallel uh, paths between the Ottoman Greeks migrating to the U.S. and the Armenians, and whether there are connections in the U.S. when they are there. So the Ottoman Armenians, right? Not the, the, not the Armenians from Armenia, but the, the Ottoman Armenians, uh, to be specific. Um, you know, in uh, in all the interviews that I've done, um, the only sort of 
connection that I've seen is through sort of a lamentful memory of genocide. Um, and I can't say sort of off the top of my head here because uh, off the top of my head whether or not those connection points were from the immigrant generation. In other words, uh, uh, the ancestors who migrated to the United States made these connections. Um, I'm thinking of a particular uh, uh, interviewee now in um, New York, in uh, um, Albany, who mentioned that they would all get together and play cards, you know. Oh, she said, uh, Jews, Armenians, Greeks, we would all sit there playing cards together and we all spoke, spoke Turkish to one another. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't, th the rest is just about genocide, you know, and sort of how they had this connection point of, you know, the, the narrative about, you know, the Armenians were first, the Greeks were next, or would be next. That comes up sometimes uh, in, the, um, in the interviews. Uh, but sort of the immigrant generation itself, that's sort of the only one that comes to mind. Um, so I don't know if they, they were, they were core religionists, that's possible. I suppose, but I don't want to misrepresent the data because I can't remember right now off the top of my head if, if that was the case. Thank you for your question. I am mindful of the time and uh, of the fact that some people may want to go to the exhibit. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank you very much uh, for a very rich presentation and an even richer uh, Q&A uh, period. I have a lot of questions uh, myself. I mean, you didn't mention music at all, except for the Zeybekiko, but uh, I wonder whether, you know, in terms of Armenians and Greeks and Jews, we can find connections there, and maybe this is a different project uh, for somebody else, not you. <laughs> Uh, but also, uh, you know, the connections with the Greek-American community and whiteness in the South and Ahepa, and there are so many things that seem to be happening uh, in, in this sort of couple of decades uh, that I'm sure, I mean, you're addressing in your work. But thank you very much, and thank you all for participating. Thank you. Λοιπόν, μπορείτε να, μπορούμε να κατέβουμε κάτω για ένα ποτήρι κρασί και όσοι θέλετε να πάτε στην έκθεση θα είναι ανοιχτή για καμιά ώρα ακόμα. Ευχαριστώ. Thank you.